Okay, um, thanks very much for the opportunity to be here. This is an interesting thing. I really enjoyed having this talk. I'm looking forward to Fabio's. Fabio and I are talking about some things that are sort of related because we're both talking about using um, AI and machine learning to connect to laboratory data, uh, laboratory friction data, laboratory um, earthquake data. And I'm gonna talk to you specifically about using machine learning to um, to predict some things about lab earthquakes. And uh, so I'm showing you a fault here in the top. If we're sending elastic waves through fault zones of this um, dimension in the lab and, and measuring also the shear stress along the fault. And so, yeah, just to take a second here, this black curve is showing the shear stress and they're showing three complete laboratory seismic cycles where the shear stress is building up and then there's a failure. This is a stick slip type of frictional failure, and, and it's uh, the equivalent of a laboratory earthquake. What you can see here is that there's clear, clear precursors to failure. The P wave speed goes up for a while, and then it starts to decrease well before the event. And also the transmitted amplitude goes up, and it, it starts to decrease well before the event. There's an interesting reason why the these two things show different behaviors that I won't go into, but they're both basically showing you when the fault kind of unlocks. The fault isn't, ever, isn't really ever completely locked, but there's a point early in the seismic cycle where the fault's moving, not moving very fast at all. Once the fault starts to move, the transmitted amplitude and the velocity go down. And those things are being used to predict when the failure is going to occur. This is work from a lot of people. And um, I won't leave you on this slide long enough to read all the names right now, but this is being recorded so you can look back at it. There's been, I'll, I'll introduce people along the way, but this is the work that many people have been involved in. Um, what's happened, the reason that it's possible to use um, machine learning to um, predict laboratory earthquakes is that we have lots and lots of them. This is, this is a series, all of these black lines here are laboratory earthquakes. And it's possible using um, technique, techniques that we've learned over the last few years to produce complicated sets of them. So there, there's a kind of an interesting bi-directional um, science that's happening here of using machine learning to predict some things about the earthquakes and also to learn something about earthquake physics at the same time. Um, I think I told you enough about this just in the very first slide, just to say, yeah, here's, it takes a few microseconds for the waves to travel through. And then you do waveform cross-correlation to, to predict and to measure tiny changes in the, in the transmitted amplitude and velocity. And they're going through, you know, these are laboratory conditions going through the, the laboratory faults. We are also at the same, at the same time making measurements now um, on, a, on um, seismic data in the field and using machine learning techniques to distinguish between foreshocks and aftershocks in central Italy. Um, it is the, the idea is that we're probably able to see, we hope we can see the same kinds of things in the field that we're seeing in the laboratory. Obviously, we don't have the same kind of data. But what we're doing is we're training machine learning models to identify the difference between foreshocks and aftershocks based on what we think are minor variations in the, the, um, the attenuation and the velocity. What's interesting when you think about the lab earthquake problem is to go back to this paper from 1973 and realize that there was a lot of excitement about earthquake prediction associated with measurements just like these, associated with the idea that the B value was changing um, before rock failure and associated with the idea that um, you could see changes in elastic wave speed prior to failure. I won't go through all the details, but it's a kind of a simple model where you think the closer you get to failure, the bigger they're the bigger the events are, that explains why B value goes down. And, um, and the more you see changes in wave speed. So this is, you know, this is a 50 year old problem. This was known in the late sixties and the early seventies that these kinds of things existed. But what you never could do was to predict when the event was gonna happen even in the lab. And it, it didn't happen until this paper in 2017 where um, Bertrand and Claudia uh, people in Paul Johnson's group at Los Alamos realized that by looking carefully and using machine learning techniques on the continuous seismic data coming from lab experiments, you could predict when the events were gonna happen. Okay, so this is from 2017. We've been working on this. Um, this was from data that was produced in my laboratory at Penn State 
I've since been um, building a laboratory and working with people in um, here in, in an existing laboratory in Rome. I'm in Rome right now, still interacting with the people and running my lab at Penn State. But lots of stuff has happened since 2017, not surprisingly. And what's possible now to say is that, you know, we can predict the time of failure. We're predicting magnitude of the stress drop. We're predicting the fault zone stress date and the fault zone slope velocity. And here's a few papers that cover the stuff that we've been involved in. Um, uh, Fabio Corby is going to talk right after this, and he's going to tell you about some other things. So I just focused on the stuff that came out of things that I was involved in and that, that came out of data sets from my lab. Okay. What's, what's happened so far is to use both passive recordings and active recordings of the fault zone. So the passive thing is just listening to, with a, a laboratory seismometer, listening to the events that are occurring in with, within a fault zone. What's interesting and useful here is to look at the details of the data, right? So this is one lab seismic cycle. The black curve you're seeing on top is, is shear stress. This is shown as a function of time. And then this is the, the, the laboratory seismogram. But what I want you to see is that it just basically looks like noise. It's not trivial to, to take that and learn something from it. But initially using feature-based um, random forest kind of models and XG boost kind of models, it was already possible to predict some things from it, to look at that data, to look at features and characteristics of the continuous signal, and to predict the time of failure. Um, so that was what was done in the, in the original work. And um, you know, I'm I'm making a point here that you know, late in the seismic cycle, if you zoom in on one little piece, you can see events um, that look a little bit like a real seismogram, but basically you don't see much at all initially. Um, so that was what so what was done initially in, in the in the work of 2017 and a few years after that. A lot has happened since then. Deep learning models have been used, autoregressive models have been used. This autoregressive idea is a little bit like what's now being called the natural language processing. By feeding enough data into with autoencoders and decoders, feeding enough data into a, a, a deep learning model, then it knows how to predict what's going to happen next. And it actually works reasonably well. Um, there's a lot of you know, things that it doesn't predict yet. But you, if you look at the laboratory seismic cycle and look at this autoregressive approach, what you can see is that it's possible to predict with decent accuracy what happens within, within about one more seismic cycle after where you are. So this model here is trying to predict the shear stress based on the acoustic properties and trying to forward predict them into the future. This also shows on the right just some um, quick images of for a, a couple of different types of experiments, the, the relationship between the, the, the data and the machine learning based models of them. Okay, so this is the shear stress. This is the time of failure. This is the time to the end of failure. So, you know, if you predicting the time of failure is one thing that's useful, but also if you can predict when the failure is going to end, it means you can predict the time of the, um, the, the length of the event and the magnitude of slip that's going to occur. Okay, so a lot of, of the early work was done with um, passive recordings, just listening to the fault. But then we've also started looking at um, active source information. And this is mostly work that's been done by Shrisharan Sridharan and also Parisa Shikui. I, I put this slide here to sort of remind us a little bit why what's interesting. I mean, we know that it's possible to predict them, and we're really working uh, hard on understanding why it's possible. You know, we don't really know the physics of, of why it's possible. We have some ideas based on the early work. But a lot of interesting stuff comes from the, the systematic nature of this data. This is stress drop as a function of peak slip velocity for a range of events from fast to slow. And I just want you to see that, you know, the cumulative seismic energy for faster and bigger stress drop events is bigger. So it's a lot of like systematics that, go, that we can use to help us understand what's going on here. If we look at the active source stuff, which is kind of where I started, um, I want you to just see the laboratory seismic cycles down here and the amplitude of the waves that are transmitted through the laboratory fault zone and how those are now being used to predict some things and how I think those are an interesting thing into the future for us because the active source information gives you some real hardcore information about the fault zone context um, states um, in, in the fault. 
And by that, I mean, so I'm returning now to this plot that we saw a few times early on, transmitting the amplitude through a fault zone that looks like this, and the P wave velocity. And what I want you to think about is what you know about the um, about contact junctions in a frictional problem, right? Every one of these junctions can be approximated like a Hertz contact and can be you know, thought of in terms of the JKR contact theory. So if we do that, it means that this, this data on transmitted amplitude and velocity gives us some direct information about the contact geometry and how that's changing during the seismic cycle, right? And what I think of is, is you know, useful about this is to remember that, yeah, the, the reason the P wave velocity goes up until it starts to move is something that Coulomb wrote about in the 1700s, right? He knew that um, friction eight changed as a function of contact time, right? And this is a fundamental part of the rate of state friction law, this aging idea. So the longer the contacts sit in, the longer the contacts live and sit, they don't have to be stationary, but they can't move too far, the stronger they get. And so it's not surprising that we see this. And in fact, we can back out of this some things about the way the contacts work. And so that's led to, this is work that's been done in Parisa Shikui's group that we've been involved in at Penn State. And it is building that physics-informed information into the neural network and putting it directly into the loss function of the of the of a deep learning model, a bunch of different deep learning models. Okay. And so there's two things that are being done. Okay, I'd set myself a timer. That was 12 minutes. So I think I just have like two more if that's okay. Um so yes, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. So um there are two things that are being built into the loss function of this deep learning model. One is the elastic coupling between the fault and the surroundings, and then the fault contact stiffness. And those both come directly from that active source information. And just you know, schematically, you can kind of see the way the model works, this multi-layer percepton model. You can see the two physics constraints there. We're taking the transmitted amplitude and getting the stiffness from it. And then we're also building in the idea, and that's in this equation. And then we're also building that idea is that we're solving for the velocity so we can use that to um, tell us something about what happens in the experiments. Very quickly, training validation testing is going on, sort of a standard approach. You can see the relationship between a couple of different models and the data. And below, you can see the residual. And I guess, that, you know, this is not, yeah, I'm not going to show you this long enough to get all the details. But the point is that these active source models, deep learning models, are really good. They, they predict, this is just trying to predict the shear stress here. They're really good. Um, a bunch of stuff's been doing, been, we've been working with to understand transfer learning about how to take this information from the lab and take it to the field or how to take it between um, lab experiments. If you use deep learning, the transfer learning gets better. Um, a lot of this is part of um, the project that I'm running here in Rome that's, that's funded by the ERC. So I want to acknowledge that funding. And um, you can learn more about that by looking in different places. Um, I didn't, I won't go into details about this, but the paper is about to be submitted. And one paper has already been published by Laura Lorenti. And um, so I, I talked about this a little bit before, but it's possible to take deep learning models and feed it seismograms and have it learn the difference between foreshocks and aftershocks based on what we think are differences in, in uh, uh, attenuation in the Earth's crust. We're not the only people interested in this. Okay, you guys are. But, um, you know, the age of AI, this is a little thing that was produced by uh, Network Entertainment uh, a few years ago, and it was hosted by Robert Downey Jr. Lots of people interested in, in AI and lab earthquake prediction for that matter. Quick point about summary, um, you know, we're, we're interested in why it works. We know something about the mechanisms of precursors, and it puts us in a nice mode because it's possible to have physics-informed models. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention.